escorted a prisoner. It was a long-term prisoner down from his his house block on his wing down to an appointment with the the, the prison doctor. Um, you don't actually attend that appointment with the prisoner. The prisoner will win with the doctor himself. So I don't know what the appointment was for or what happened, but obviously whatever happened, the prisoner didn't get the answer or didn't get whatever it was he was looking for. And he just came out the office into the, the corridor in the healthcare department and he just swung one big almighty haymaker and caught me right in the side of the head and it took me right off my feet and I landed in a heap outside the nurse's door and, and I had to call a, what they call a first response which is press a button on your radio and every officer that's available will attend the scene and I just remember I'm being what we called at the time pretzeled up with the, the locks on and stuff and for anybody that doesn't know it's that it's, it's part of a control and restraint procedure and there's certain pressure you can put on you can put on just a little bit of pressure or you can put on a lot of pressure and if you put on a lot of pressure it's sore it really is sore then you've got one guy on this arm you've got one guy in this arm you've got a guy in your legs and you've got a guy on your head and I just remember the prisoner being escorted out under locks and they just dragged his face right along the ground all the way up to what they called in Kilmarnock Jail, the, the SRU, the Separation and Reintegration Unit. It was a seg, segregation uh, and it was just kind of shipped out to another jail straight after that. But I just remember thinking after it happened and everything settled down, like, wow, like I've really got to be on my guard constant but it's allowed out the next day for um, to collect his lunch from the survey in the, the segregation unit and he used the, the pantyhose the, the, the panty hose to attack the the prisoner that was serving his um his meal and the prisoner ended up in a coma dived right off the top flat head first into the floor and that's the that, uh, horrendous horrendous and it's just, it, and, and it, the, the thing that made them do it was just pure paranoia. Hello, everybody. Today, we've got Martin, who was an ex-prison officer on the podcast. If you've watched Chris McPherson's channel, he's had some fantastic guests on recently. I was on a long drive and I listened to his podcast with Martin. And I was blown away by Martin's storytelling ability his charisma the details the madness we're going to start out actually with quite an intense story from prison and then we'll go back to how it all began and go over his story in the order it happened so first off huge thank you to chris mcpherson for arranging this i urge people to go and sub to his channel i'll put a link in the description box and i'm going to be seeing chris I'm Martin at the Michael Francis gig in Glasgow on April 1st. So there'll be a link down there for that as well. Hope if you're up in Glasgow, you come and join us. So a huge thank you for coming on, Martin. No, no problem, Sean. Thanks very much for having me. It's uh, an absolute pleasure. I've been in, um, watching your channel for a good few years now. And uh, it's just a wee bit surreal being actually on it myself. So <laughs> thanks very much for having me, mate. Oh, well, I really appreciate that. And um, I loved watching you on Chris's channel. I think I said to Chris... You know, we've had loads on from Glasgow. It seems like there's so many brilliant stories up there. It's, it's endless. Yeah, and, it's, um, I mean, it's a bad, it can be a bad place at times, especially in the, <laughs> the, the establishments and things that we're going to be talking about today in jail. So, yeah, brilliant. Before, before we start with one of your craziest stories, Martin, how long were yeah. you a prison officer for? So, in the, overall, I, I, I would probably be considered a rookie to most prison officers um, unfortunately due to circumstances out with my own control at the time I had to kind of leave and finish up my career in there early so overall only done about three four years and which prison were you at where we're going to tell the story HM, of, the, it, of the four men yeah I was at HMP Kilmarnock in Ayrshire um, so it was a it's a maximum security prison, I would say, but it was a mixture of both remand short-term prisoners 
long term prisoners and sex offenders. So it's a mix of everything. All right. Well, let's set the table for this story then. Yeah. You know, the, the, four, the four gentlemen. What was your first inkling that something was going to happen there? So, for anybody that isn't um, familiar with a prison setting or a prison environment, when you walk onto a, a hall or a wing, is they were called in Kowalik, you just you can just feel, you can smell, you can taste an atmosphere, and you know something's about to kick off. You can't always put your finger on it or pin, pinpoint where it's coming from or what it's going to be, but you just know, you just know that something's about to kick off. So on this particular day, I had walked onto the wing and it was just to collect some prisoners to take them down to healthcare um, to get medications and things and things like that. Um, but very quickly after arriving on the wing, I knew. I knew there was something about to kick off and I wasn't going to be leaving anytime soon. And what had happened is, is there was a group of four prisoners um, what we, we call hold up on the wing, um, which basically means that they'd done something they weren't supposed to do. There was no space in the segregation unit in the prison at the time, so basically they were locked away in their cells on the wing, on a roll, as we would call it. But somehow these prisoners managed, managed to get themselves out their cells at the same time for showers and phone calls and stuff and what they had been doing um, for a couple of days previous to this is they had been collecting um, feces and urine and stuff in a, a big bucket uh, and I think each of them had a, a particular job right? and I would probably go as far to say the worst job would be the stiller's job who would that would be his job to, to mix it all up and stuff like that so they'd been collecting the, the urine and the feces for a couple of days and unfortunately it was a young um, female officer that unlocked the the gentleman in question that had was in possession of this bucket at the time and as soon as uh, his cell door opened they proceeded to put the bucket over her head and not just throw it over her head he actually put the bucket above her head and down over her head and I'll never, ever forget the smell and the sound that it made. It was absolutely horrendous. It was just like a, like just two days worth of thick feces and urine mixed together. It was absolutely horrendous. Um, so the the wing itself was locked down straight away um, and there was a response called for any uh, officers in the vicinity to attend and stuff. And it transpired that the, the reason these guys done this is because they wanted moved. They obviously didn't like the fact that they were on a roll, uh, locked away, probably 22 and a half, 23 hours a day on this um, uh, wing. So um, I think they thought that they were going to get the treatment from the the wing down to the segregation unit and follow what we would call normal protocol for moving prisoners on. And for some strange reason, they must have thought that they were all going to be moving on to the same place together so that they could be together. But it wasn't the case. Um, there was a C and R team uh, called, which for anybody that doesn't know what that is, it's controlling the strain, or as it's more widely or commonly known in the Scottish prison system, is the Mufti mob. So the officers were sent to kind of gear up with all their kind of riot gear and stuff, shields and helmets and all that stuff, and they were physically dealt with within their cells um, initially. And it, it was like, I, I, I referred to it like a game Monopoly. It, like, don't pass go, don't collect 200 quid straight to jail. They were taken straight out the back door in a hall, straight onto a G4S van. And the four of them, four of them were moved to the four corners of Scotland. So one was in the northeast and one was in the southwest. And another one was centrally and somewhere, <laughs> somewhere else. And I think... Um, whatever the outcome they thought was going to happen, it was the complete opposite. So I think they just kind of made their bed, shall we say. So word got about the prison system, the, the different establishments they went to, and I don't think they had a great time out after that. Wow. So, Martin, I can understand half the logic there, but half of it seems to be flawed. So, you know, they're going to do something to try and move. I understand that much. But, like, to target a female officer knowing that the male officers are going to be very protective yeah. over the female officers. 
And usually if they target an officer, the officer kind of has got a bit of an attitude or has done something, or it just seems that she was <laughs> unlucky she, she, that day. To be, to, you've, you've just said it yourself, Sean, I think it was just a case of her being really unlucky that she was the officer that had, to, but had opened the, uh, his door that morning. And I don't think it would have really mattered too much to the prisoner in question who it was that opened the door. All he knew was is that's when it was happening, that's when it was agreed, and it's happening no matter what. And unfortunately, it was the female officer. And to be fair, the, the female officer had a great relationship with the prisoner's honour wing. That was her wing. She worked on that wing. Um, so um, I could probably imagine that the, the, the prisoners had a bit of remorse and felt a bit sympathetic, but in their heads, this is going to happen, and it doesn't matter who it is, it's at the other side of the door. Unfortunately for the female in question, it was her, and uh, it, it wasn't very pleasant. Wow. So as a young person then, in your life, did you ever imagine you'd end up in a world like that, doing work? No, I, I didn't, to be perfectly honest with you, and I'll go into how it came about in more detail as we talk about how things led up to me becoming a prison officer, but um, I grew up in a sort of kind of prisoner, prison environment, and the reason I say that is because my mum worked in a prison, and she probably worked in, she, or she did, I don't, I don't mean probably, she did, she worked in one of the most notorious prisons in Scotland, which is HMP Shots. Um, I know there's, you've had a few guys on your podcast that have served some time in there, it's Scotland's most secure prison, it's maximum security prison, and it's for long-term prisoners. Um, but I've always been intrigued and um, sort of enjoyed true crime and um, prison documentaries and listening to stories from guys that have been in jail and different things like that, particularly from a few guys that you've had on your podcast, uh, the likes of um, big, uh, Ian Blink McDonald and Paul Ferris and things like that. So um, it's always been... I've always enjoyed listening to stories and um, watching documentaries and stuff like that, but it was never ever something that I kind of set out to do. That 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 that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do, and I'm going to achieve it. It was. Um, it all came through certain circumstances and events that happened in my life, and um, as much as we'll go into all the things. That that happened while I was there and different things. It's um, it was a great experience for me, and it's I probably for all the bad things that happened would, wouldn't change it either. So, Martin, did, did your mum used to tell you stories when she come home from shots? So, she she wouldn't really tell us too much because when she walked in there, I've I've got a twin brother, so both is obviously growing up at the same age and stuff. We were quite young when my work, my mum worked in the jail, so I don't I, I don't ever recall her telling us anything into any, any nitty gritty details or stuff. She would tell us the the odd story and I think it was more for to try and avert us from going down any sort of road that would lead us to being on the wrong side of the fence, if you get what I mean. So uh, I do remember being when I was young, uh, Shots Prison used to hold it and this might seem crazy to some people and even when I speak about it now, it seems a bit crazy because I don't think it would ever happen now, but HMP Shots used to hold a family day for the staff and they were able to bring their spouses and their kids in for a tour of the jail and to see different parts of the jail. And it wasn't it wasn't just like the reception or anything like that. It was deep into the heart of the jail, into the halls where all the prisoners were eh, banged up and stuff. And it was, I'll never ever forget that experience when I first went in as a young boy and it was just, you could feel that you were surrounded by bad people. And one of the things that I always speak about when you first go into a jail setting is the smell. And the smell would, will never, ever leave you when you smell that for the first time. Um, I explained on uh, Chrissy's podcast when I'd done it, trying to just pinpoint and nail what that smell would be. It's just a hundred guys living in close proximity, sweating and farting and burping and all this stuff and there's just no air filtration. Everything's contained within a, a close space. It's just a, a very, very unique smell, shall we say. 
Yeah, that's a good description. I do remember all those smells, and I also remember like the smell of bleach because there'd always be a yeah. mop bucket or some bleach getting put somewhere. Yeah, there was always a the, the past men and things out on the past men on a wing would be guys that were out with their cells when everybody else was banged up to do cleaning duties and stuff on the uh, on the wings and they wouldn't use bleach sparingly that's for sure it would be flung about everywhere and uh, it properly burnt the lining of your nostrils um, whenever you walked on after they'd done all the, the cleaning and stuff so yeah it was a, a mixture between kind of thick bleach and bodily bodily odours Definitely. Ma- yeah. Martin, when you went on that family visit then to see shots with your mum, how old are you? And you said, you you know, you felt the presence of bad men, but did that scare you? Did it, you, how did you feel? So uh, I just always remember feeling, yeah, I, I, I would go as far to say feeling quite scared because on the lead up going through the prison, we were obviously taking on like a tour type thing and the guy that was taking us round and showing us different places would tell us the reasons why some of these guys were there and the majority of the guys that are in shots or certainly at that time were in for murder um, so it, as a young boy I think I was probably I was somewhere between 8 and 10 years old um, so it was it was quite a scary kind of intimidating place uh, being on the halls and you see the, the guys had obviously been locked up not long before we had arrived and you could still smell, um, that, like, say, uh, they'd been smoking and stuff and just graffiti everywhere. And um, there was women, the, the, this particular hall we went on to into the recreation room and there was a snooker table. Well, what was left of a snooker table because it had been smashed up and stuff. It was just, it was a very intimidating experience, but I, I enjoyed it as well because... I was always intrigued as to where my mum worked and what it was like because as kids, more often than not, at some point growing up, will always tend to see where it, where their parents work and what they do. But obviously, with my mum working in a prison, it was never the case. It was just this kind of I don't I don't know, just like an enigma type thing, if you will. It was just this place that you don't really know anything about and you can't go anywhere near. And to be able to go in there and see firsthand exactly where she worked and the type of environment it was, I think it gave myself, definitely myself, and I I would presume my brother as well, a lot more respect for my mum. She was a single mum bringing us up and for a young female at the time to go into an environment like that to bring home a living was... Obviously, you didn't think about it like that then, but looking back now, um, going into situations like that, I, I remember the, there was times where the prison had kicked off with the prisoners and my mum couldn't even home because the place was locked down. It was nobody in and nobody out until the situation was under control. And I always remember feeling scared for my mum when I was young when that happened. It didn't happen very often, but it happened on a couple of occasions and I always remember feeling quite scared for my mum's safety, even back then at that young age. So it was great to go in and experience it firsthand and see what it was all about. So for a lot of kids, that experience would probably put them off wanting to work in prison, but it sounds like it, it set a seed, it planted a seed in your mind. I think subconsciously, yeah, it, it must have done because um, whenever the opportunity came about for me to go and work in a prison, it's not something that I looked back on and thought, oh, I don't know about this and I don't know about that. I was really ex- excited, but in the time between visiting in Shots Prison and becoming a prison officer, I got really heavily into, as I said earlier, true crime and podcasts and documentaries and stuff. And it was just always really intriguing because for as much as people come on to podcasts and platforms like this and speak about their experiences and tell different stories and stuff, I don't think anything can ever fully show or give off exactly how a setting in an environment like that feels. Do you know what I mean? You'll know yourself, Sean. It's very, very unique. And unless you've actually been in there and felt it, you can never truly and fully understand just what the environment's like. It's very, very unique. 
Yeah, and that causes you to bond with the people in there with you because you can talk about it all day long, you can write about it all day long, but you know it's only the people who were there that truly yeah. understand the intensity. And Yeah, I mean, I think in, from what I experienced, a lot of prison officers only socialise with other prison officers because they tend not to really know or talk about much else other than jail. And the only other people that they can talk about that with that will understand what they're talking about is fellow prison officers. So they, they become, a, I wouldn't go as far to say a family, but they come a close-knit unit and prison officers end up just being friendly and socialising with other prison officers. And for other people on the outside looking in, they might look like a bit of a loner or seem like a bit of a loner or a recluse or something like that. It's not the case. I just think, I think especially for officers that have done it for a long time, it becomes just part of them and they don't really know anything else other than prison. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think in many respects it's probably quite sad, but 100% I can understand why, why it happens like that for them, uh, unfortunately. So the seed was planted, you've had your visit, it's it's something that's kind of hereditary because it's in the family. What was it as you matured, you know, as a teenager, as you went through school then, what grew in your mind that solidified the idea to become a prison officer? So it wasn't until I was a lot older, to be honest with you, Sean. Um, a, 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 a funny story, kind of slightly off track. Um, when I had left school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't have anything in my head. I didn't have any set plan. But as I mentioned earlier on, I've got a twin brother and um, it was his, it was always his plan that he wanted to join the military. He wanted to get into the army. Um, so he went off and done all these tests and things for the army and stuff. And when um, push came to shove and it was time for him to go, he was like, oh, no, nah, I don't want to go on my own. And he's like, to me, like, will you come with me? And I was like, well, there's nothing else really happening else that, that job-wise out here that I may as well, and I joined the army, <laughs> but without actually wanting to join the army. So um, straight from uh, leaving school at 16, I joined the army, uh, and I was a tank driver in the army. I was there for six years. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, uh, I was based out in Germany, out in Fallen, Boston, in Germany. Um, but after that, I, 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 le I left... I, I got a bit sick of being stuck out in Germany all the time. I had friends that were in the army, but they were stationed back home and they were getting to come home all the time and see their friends and girlfriends and things like that. And I was, I felt like I was kind of stuck over in Germany. So I uh, eventually left there and when I came back out into Civvy Street, I was back to square one. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and I saw a job advert online um, that, um, Scotrail, the train operating company in Scotland, were looking for trainee train drivers. So I applied for that, thinking absolutely no chance. And it was like a six or eight month um, recruitment process and ended up becoming a train driver. <laughs> I was a train driver in Scotrail. Um, I'd done that for five years. Um, and unfortunately, due to ill health and stuff um, and a couple of other factors, I, I, I finished up there as well. And that is when I seen the advert for HMP Kowalik and they were looking for prison officers. And I thought, you know what, by this time, I was really into the, the documentaries and the true crime and different things like that. And I thought, you know what, I'll, I'm going to apply for that. And uh, it was always in the back of my mind that I was going to join to be a prison officer to try and make a difference. Um, but it became quite apparent very quickly that you don't really make a difference. It's just getting the prisoners through the routine of the day and that's about it. But I did apply for it and I remember going to the interviews and stuff. They held them in a local um, hotel and there was at least 500 people there uh, interviewing for a job to become a prison officer. Would you say that it's a natural transition to go from the military to become working in corrections? Because we've seen historically it's kind of been dominated by people who come from the military. Yeah, I don't. I, I think 
a lot of people leave the, the, the military and they probably either become uh, go into the police or the fire brigade or the prison service or things like that. And I think the attraction for them is the the discipline, the close knit feeling of a close knit kind of family um, with your comrades and stuff, uniforms and probably just that little bit of power as well. Um, so I think it probably is a natural kind of progression from the military to these sort of sectors, police, fire brigade, prison service, where you've got the the, the, the uniforms and the camaraderie with, with your, yourself and your, your colleagues. So you do see a lot of it. So how old are you and what year was it when you started your training? So when I started my training, it was 2016. And let me just do some quick maths in my head now. Um, I would have been... 28, 28, I would have been 28. And I imagine yeah. the training was quite easy for you. Yeah, the, I, I did, if I'm being honest with you, find the training quite easy, but for the viewers and stuff that are, are watching, HMP Kilmarnock was a, a private jail. So it wasn't run by the Scottish Prison Service, it was run by a, a company called Serco, and it was a business at the end of the day, but all the training for it was different to the Scottish Prison Service in the respect that everything, well, 80% of the training was done in-house by the staff that worked in that particular establishment. So it was very, kind of, um, how would I describe it? It was, all the training was sort of um, pushed in that it was specific to Kilmarnock Jail. Um, specific to the type of prisoners that they receive, and to be honest with you, that I, I I thought it was a lot better that the training was in the establishment that you were going to work in, because in the Scottish Prison Service they go to like a training college, and they do a lot of generic training, and then they'll go to their particular establishments, and then they'll be trained on kind of things that are kind of local for them at, at their establishment, whereas we were trained in the house and the training was geared towards everything that happened in Kilmarnock because uh, different jails have got different routines and stuff. Um, you get open prisons, you get maximum security prisons, you get working prisons, which HMP Kilmarnock was, it was a working prison. So prisoners were in a routine where they got up in the morning and they went to work and different things like that. So all the training was sort of geared towards the routine and everything that happened in HMP Kilmarnock. The best part of my training was the control and restraint. Mm -hmm. We went to a Scottish prison service estate to do that with the Scottish prison service um, and it was just a week of absolute <laughs> mayhem running about <laughs> with batons and shields and helmets and just <laughs> causing absolute carnage. Huh? Um, it was great fun. It was, I, enjoyed, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the physical side of it. Did you have to reenact riots and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was we 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 done went through a whole host of different scenarios where it was um, there was the actual prison officers that done the training were acting as the the prisoners and they were having riots and they were shouting abuse at us and throwing <laughs> uh, projectiles and all different stuff like that and we obviously used our training to control and diffuse the situation and stuff and then. We did things like non-compliant prisoners. Um, there's techniques where um, if prisoners aren't compliant, there's like pressure points and stuff like that that you can use to make them comply, shall we say. Um, we done like hostage taking situations and all different things like that. So it was really, it was really good and it was insightful as well because there's a lot of situations that you can come across in jail that you would, but prior to doing that training or being in that environment, you just the, the thought of it just would never ever come across your mind yeah, so it was good, it was very insightful and I, I, I really did enjoy it In terms of people's physical fitness then, what was the highest bar in the training? So this I, this is just my, my own opinion um, other people might have different opinions but I don't think there was a high bar at all um, the, physically the, the, for 
becoming a prison officer. In that establishment with that company, they done a beep test, um, and that was it. Basically, you went in and done a beep test in the gym, um, with the PTIs, and I can, if I remember correctly, there was at least two, I think, possibly three, um, people that had started on my course that failed the beep test initially, and when I showed up for the first day, they were on the course anyway. So for people, you know, we've got people all over the world, perhaps some wondering what's a beep test. What what do you have to do? I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I've got some exciting news to announce. Michael Francis is coming back to tour the UK in 2024. The remade mentor, the Michael Francis story. Michael Francis, once named one of the 50 most significant mob bosses in the USA by Fortune magazine, and a former member of the notorious Colombo crime family, will take you deep into the world of organized crime, sharing captivating tales and insights into the Mafia's past, present, and future. Join us for an unforgettable evening with Michael Francis, the original Goodfella, as he exclusively sits down with myself, Sean Atwood. With me as the host, there's going to be a no-holes-barred exploration of Michael Francis's life, including his numerous arrests and jury trials that ultimately led to his pleading guilty to a federal racketeering charge, a 10-year prison sentence, and $15 million in restitution. You will have the unique opportunity to ask questions during an audience Q&A session, making this event a must-see for true crime enthusiasts and anyone curious about the underworld. Don't miss this explosive In Conversation with Michael Francis. Live on stage in the UK, this exclusive in-person event will be held in various locations in the UK, Ireland and Scotland. Link in the description box below this video if you want to grab yourself a ticket. Back to the podcast. Cheers. This particular case, it was a, a gym hall and it was from a bench to a bench. And you've got to be able to run from point A to point B before the beep on the speaker sounds. And the more you're doing it, the faster the beep becomes and you go through different levels. And I, I, I would be lying if I could say if I, I remember what level you were expected to get to. And that would clash you as fit enough to do the job. Um, but I know for um, a fact there was two, possibly three, on my course on the day. Before the training started, this was, that they, they failed the beep test. And when I showed up for the first day of the training, they were... They were there on the course anyway, so I don't know why they even bothered holding two days worth of fitness tests when people were failing and they were going to start them anyway. So once you've completed your training, what happens next? So after the training, it's a lot of the training was done in-house, as I said, and it was a lot of PowerPoint presentations and theory, theoretical work exams and different things like that. But um, if I could just go into a, a bit of a story about what happened with me when my training finished. Um, when my tra- There was about, I think, 12 or 13 people on my training course, and I think just everybody bar one got to the end of the training, um, and there was a presentation at the end of it where you're presented with your, your name badges and w- what they call it's like. I can't remember the, the proper term for the card, but if you... If you think it's something similar to like a policeman's warrant card, um, so it's it's this card that you've got to have on you at all times, and it's basically proof that you've been passed a fit and able person to carry out the duties of a prison officer. So at the presentation, you get this card and your name badges, and well done, you're, you're a prison officer now, brilliant. But at the end of every course that they do, it, it, it's, it's common for the course to go out for a celebration drink and stuff. Um, after the course is finished, so being us, we 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 done the same. It's just tradition for the guys to do it. So we met up a couple of days after the training was finished and went out for a celebration drink and stuff. And the instructor that had taken our course had showed up for the first hour or so just to show face and whatever else. And I always remember we were in this um, pub. It was in the height of summer and it was really warm which is quite unusual for Scotland, if I'm honest. Um, we were in the beer garden, and before the 
the instructor left to go home, he, he told me and a couple of others, he's like, right, now, I'm going to tell you that there's other staff members from the jail in this pub at the moment, so watch what you are doing and behave yourself type thing. And I was like, God, no problem. Nobody was going to misbehave anyway. Well, I didn't think they would, but um, it did become apparent quite quick that there was other staff members in there. How they knew where we were um, and what pub we were in, I don't know, but they kind of started kind of edging closer and closer to our group as people started dwindling away, going home and moving on to different places and that. There was just a few of us left. But these two staff members that I'm talking about were, were female staff members and they had been working in the jail for a couple of years prior to me starting as an officer. But as the night went on, they kind of edged closer and closer and kind of tagged on to the group as such. And it got to a point in the night where they'd said, we're going to move on somewhere else. And they told me where they were going. And, and for me, it was closer to home. So I thought, yeah, no problem. I'll come <coughs> with you and whatever else. So they'd organised a lift um, for us and uh, took us back to this other pub that was closer to home and stuff. Uh, and just shortly after arriving in the pub, two gentlemen arrived that the females obviously knew. Um, so they kind of joined on to us at, at our table and we were sitting, we were having a few drinks, having a laugh. And the two guys were brand new. They were they were uh, talking away to me. Uh, they made me feel welcome because I felt like these two females have asked me along for a drink. And the feeling that I got when the two gentlemen arrived was that this must be their partners. So I felt a little bit awkward, kind of gooseberry type thing. So I kind of made my excuses and I left and, and went home. And I'd been off on holiday for a few days after the intensive training course that we'd just done. And um, my first proper day on shift, I remember going back on the Monday. Um, and I went through all the normal processes at the gatehouse of the jail. I was searched and um, everything else, collected my radios. And then you go through security doors and then into another, through another security door where all the officers' keys are in cases. And it's uh, it works on biometric, so it's your thumbprint. So I put my, my thumbprint on the scanner, expecting the case to open and my set of keys to light up for me to take them. And nothing happened, nothing at all. And I was like, that's strange. So just trying again, trying again, trying again, nothing. And then the security team came in the, the, the key room um, with the head of intelligence for the jail. And they're like, can can we have a word? And I was like, oh my God. What? Like, if, if you see them coming, there's definitely something wrong here. So it's like, oh no. So anyway, they, they invited, they, they didn't invite me up the stairs, they ordered me up the stairs and into a, like an interview room. And the reason that they'd asked me up and the reason that I couldn't find uh, uh, take my keys out was because they were investigating something that happened whilst we were on that night out. Uh, celebrating passing of course and it transpired that the two female officers that had invited me to another pub later on the night for a drink the two gentlemen that they met up with were serving prisoners and what I mean yes yeah so what I mean by that is that people will be thinking how can they be serving prisoners what I mean by that is is these two guys were in a Scottish prison service establishment called Castle Huntley and it's an open estate, an open prison. And it's a place where a lot of long-term prisoners go on the lead up to building up to being released after a long prison sentence. So whilst they're in that establishment, they start off with getting used to being in open conditions and not locked up all the time. And then they progress on to having like day release and stuff where they can go out in the local town, um, different things like that. And then eventually they end up with um, home leave, which allows them home at, at, over a particular weekend and stuff. But these two gentlemen that had met up with them were prisoners, serve, still serving time in this establishment. But where they had served the the, the majority of their prison service was in HMP Comalic, where I had worked and these two females had worked, and that's how they had met. 
<laughs> um, and one of the one of, one of the terms and conditions of these prisoners being out was that they, they don't um, that there's like what you would say bail or license conditions that if that depending on the type of crime that it might be that they're not allowed in certain areas or they're not allowed to contact certain people and definitely they're not allowed to be under the influence of any uh, drugs or alcohol or be in any establishment that sells alcohol. And me being a prison officer that hasn't even had his first proper shift as a prison officer yet, I don't know why anybody would think that I would know exactly who these guys were and what was happening right under my nose. But anyway, I was dragged into it. Um, and the reason that the, the prison found out that it had happened is because the two prisoners in question had been caught being in a, a pub, a, 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 an establishment like that. And I think to try and take the heat off theirself, when they went back, they put, they submitted a statement, and in the statement it had said that I had been not even asking, pestering them to try and score me some weight. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Now, it, nothing could be further from the truth. Believe me, nothing could be further from the truth. Anyway, that's the the the, the report they went in. So I was pulled in straight away. Um, I was asked to give a statement of uh, events and how I saw what had happened and stuff. And unfortunately for me, on my very first day as a prison officer, there was this huge big target on my back that I was never, ever, ever going to shift. And it was just horrendous the, the treatment that I got after that I was basically viewed as nothing more than a corrupt officer if I'm being honest oh my goodness I've never heard anything like this before in my life Martin so yeah, day it's... one and you're hung out to dry right away yeah, yeah. by now, two these... sta- sorry these two females could have just went on about their business and done what they were doing and nobody would have been none the wiser I don't know why they felt the need or even consider inviting another member of staff that they don't even know into that situation and none of the two females and I had my back when it came to answering the authorities at the jail either and Martin do you, think they they, went, yeah. do you think they did it strategically they put you in the mix they had some ulterior motive to kind of use you in some capacity I really I really don't know I would be lying if I said I knew exactly what was going through their heads. I, I, I'm, I just, I can all, all I can say is, is if it was me, and I was doing something like that, I wouldn't want anybody to know. Never mind a colleague from the jail to be in anywhere near that situation. So for the life of me, I can't understand why they done it. Um, but it's safe to say that none of the two females worked much longer at, at the prison after that. Um, and it wasn't just a, a meet up and a drink and stuff. They, they were in proper relationships with these with these prisoners, and the relationships carried on after they had finished uh, working in the jail. As far as I was led to believe. So Crazy how did stuff. the rest? How did the rest of your first day go? I mean, you've done your training, and now all of a sudden, all this has happened on day one. Yeah. So, <clears throat> if I'm being really truthful and honest with you, the, the rest of the day was just a blur because I. I just like I was just so anxious and worried and what was going to happen and different things like this and that if I'm being honest with you, I don't really remember my first week because it was just like worry and anxious and it was just it was horrendous. I'm trying to meet new colleagues and learn about the processes and stuff in the department that I worked in in the jail and I just wasn't taking anything in because I was just so worried about the situation that had came up on me through no fault of my own and it was just it was horrendous but like I said earlier it was just a huge target on my back and I, everybody in the jail was talking about it and that's including uh, prisoners staff and prisoners all got wind of what had happened and it was just like it's like you could feel and hear people pointing and talking about you behind your back it was horrendous Did you have anyone to talk to who was supportive your mother for example? No, I didn't uh, really, I didn't speak to anybody about it, to be honest with you. Um, not even my partner, not even my partner. Um, it was just, it was just one of those, I've, I'd always been up until 
that point or to the point when I'd finish working in the jail, very much somebody that would just keep everything to myself and try and deal with, with everything myself. But one of the things I will say is, is through the prison, there was no support or means of obtaining support or somebody to talk to or anything. You would think particularly just in general for prison officers and the environment they're working, the things that they've got to deal with and the things that they see and stuff, there would be some sort of support in place should they need it, but there was absolutely nothing, nothing at all. I did speak to my union representatives on a couple of occasions because I felt I was being kind of mistreated and not treated fairly off the back of it, um, but they weren't really interested, if I'm being honest with you. So it was just basically deal with it on my own, unfortunately. That's terrible. What part of the prison were you assigned to initially? So initially I was assigned to the reception, and for any of the watching or listening that doesn't really know what the reception is, it's basically what it says on the tin. The reception's the part of the any prison where every prisoner will come through, whether they're being admitted to jail, remanded from court, or they're coming in um, from appointments, going out to appointments, uh, everything like that. So every, everybody that comes in and out of the jail comes through the reception. Um, it's where you deal with all the prisoners' property. Um, it's some of the searching, strip searching. Um, they've also got what they call the boss chair, um, which is a kind of metal detector type chair that prisoners sit on. Um, and also initial um, welfare uh, interviews take place with every prisoner that comes in as well in the reception. So you're trained to do kind of welfare stuff. Um, I was trained um, in uh, mental health first aid as well um, to be able to conduct those interviews and stuff. So um, yeah, it's a pretty very busy kind of fast paced environment. Uh, the fast, the busiest and fastest paced environment within a jail setting is definitely a reception. That's where I was uh, initially um, put into work. What what were your biggest challenges in reception? Have you got any stories of any particular incidents? Uh, probably <clears throat> the the biggest challenges you, you can deal with um, in the reception is the likes of guys that have been sent to jail for the first time, trying to calm guys like that down, or guys that are coming in and they have maybe drug or alcohol issues and they're maybe coming off um, hard drugs and uh, years of alcohol abuse and different things like that. And also you've got the the challenges of guys that don't want to be there at all. Um, so when guys come into the, the prison from court and things like that, they come on, uh, at the time it was G4S, kind of secure prison vans and stuff. And if a guy is in one of these little dog dog boxes on one of these vans and isn't particularly keen on coming off and coming into jail, then there's certain things that need to be done and done fast to persuade, shall we say, these guys to come off the bus and into the, the prison setting. And then there's also guys that are maybe are, have been in, are, are in jail and they're going out to court appearances and, and stuff and they don't want to be going, so you've got to be uh, on on your guard, and there's certain processes and things that have got to be done to ensure guys are are going out to these appointments and um, kind of court appearances and stuff. Because I don't know exactly how much it is, but it, it costs a fair amount of money just to take one prisoner for present day an appointment and back. Um, so that's money that they see that can't be wasted, and you've got to very persuasive, especially when there's people reluctant. So it throws up a whole array of different uh, challenges and I quite enjoyed it because I like feeling challenged physically and mentally. I did at the time anyway, so it was great. But there was also big downsides to working in there as well because I um, mentioned earlier on that um, Kilmarnock Jail was a mix of remand prisoners, short-term prisoners, long-term prisoners and sex offenders. And there was a hell of a lot of sex offenders in there. And like I said, one of my responsibilities and duties whilst working in reception was a, a, a welfare uh, interview with prisoners when they come in. Um, 
and as much as the rest of the staff and the rest of the jail will know that our prisoner is a sex offender, they won't really be clued up on exactly what they've done. But for myself, being that first point of contact when they come in, I've got to deal with all their paperwork and different stuff and do that in interview. So part of the duties was to read the paperwork and what the charges were and stuff so I would know exactly what these guys were in for. And you had to try and treat them in with the same dignity and respect as you would treat everybody else. And it was really it was really difficult, we, especially when there's guys coming in that are um, either alleged or have been charged or convicted of uh, crimes or sex crimes, uh, especially towards minors. Uh, being a dad myself, it's very, very hard to even be in the same vicinity as these guys, never mind having to talk to them and speak to them and conduct interviews and ask them if they're okay. How are, how are you? How are you feeling about being here? When really deep down you're thinking, I don't really care how you're feeling. I hope you're feeling the worst you've ever felt, ever. And I hope that feeling doesn't go away until the day you, you're released with here. Not that I think you should be. But there was a whole load of different challenges. That was the biggest one, to remain calm and professional when you were in such uh, close quarters with these types of criminals. Definitely. Yeah, I, I've got a four-month-old baby here, and you think if anyone ever tried anything, you'd want to take matters into your own hand. Yeah. Which leads leads to my question then. So if they're in with the general population in reception, are there attacks on them from the regular prisoners? <clears throat> so they're not they're not in with the general population in reception or anywhere in the jail. Um, it, it, it's always it, it's a huge security risk. That is just a big no-no. So. In reception, I can't speak for another jail, but in HMP Kilmarnock, they had two tanks, what they called tanks, and one was for the general population and one was for protection prisoners, which the sex offenders would be. So they would always be kept segregated at all times. Um, the general population, always they were always given priority. So if there was processing to be done in and out of the jail or and from reception to go back up to their, their wings or their halls and stuff, you would always do the general population first and then the protection prisoners afterwards because they were, there's no other way to put it, they were just seen as the lowest of the law. Uh, so they, they weren't a priority as such. But they were always kept separate. They, they would never, ever come into contact with the general population. What about if they were going to court or what about if they had some kind of work assignment? Would would sometimes they interact then? No, never. Even like in Kilmarnock jail, when the route's moving, but they would say is the, the route's moving. So the route being the route that the prisoners take from their house blocks and their halls going down to their places of work or to other areas of the jail, there would always be a mass movement for the general population. And once all the prisoners and general population had moved and got to where they were going and they were accounted for, then they would move the protection prisoners. The protection prisoners would only ever work in what they call sheds with other protection prisoners. And if they're going out, excuse me, out to court, they would always be kept separate from them as well. It's just separate movements at all times. But there's another thing in jail as well that becomes more difficult, especially for the control team staff, is... There's, they've got a list of other prisoners within the general population that can't be in the same area as each other as well, whether it be because they've had problems in jail between two individuals before or the individuals for two different gangs or different things like that. So it's really a well-oiled cog in the respect to the, the running of the prison and the movement of prisoners because there's, just, there's so many factors you need to take into account. So you always need to make sure that you've got permission to move a particular prisoner to a particular place before you do it, because it's easy just to think, right, let's go, and you don't know who you're coming across along the routes to different areas of the jail. There's just a whole manner of things that you've got to think about just to move a prisoner from A to B. Damn, that's a shame. I was kind of rooting for the GP to have some way of getting their hands on the beast. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's one thing I've never ever seen in my whole time was... Uh, anybody from uh, general pop getting anywhere near a uh, protection prisoner. It's just not something that 
ever happened. Unfortunately. Yeah, where I was at, sometimes the beasts would take the chances and go in GP. And I so, saw some one one guy got left for dead. It, it was it was on yeah. the TV when he went to court. What he'd done? I, see, I mean, if you're a sort of you've been maybe called a bit of a high profile prisoner in the respect that you've maybe been in local newspapers or on the TV on the news or whatever else, then you're going to want to go on protection when you're in jail. Um, but I, I have I have known guys that have been on protection to come and ask to come off protection in the general population and it's just been point blank refused. Like you you won't last a minute. Like no, no chance. You stay where you are. And you deserve it anyway. So was what was the, the, the sorry. What was the first violence you encountered then? Uh so I I, I encountered kind of prisoner on prisoner violence quite quite regularly but me personally, I remember probably about six or eight weeks after I first started working properly in the jail after finishing my training and stuff. Um, I had uh, I'd escorted a prisoner. It was a long term prisoner down from his his house block on his wing down to uh, an appointment with the the, the, the prison doctor. Um, you don't actually attend that appointment with the prisoner, the prisoner will win with the doctor himself, so I don't know what the appointment was for or what happened, but obviously whatever happened, the prisoner didn't get the answer or didn't get whatever it was he was looking for and he just came out the office into the, the corridor in the healthcare department and he just swung one big almighty haymaker and caught me right in the side of the head and it took me right off my feet and I landed in a heap outside the nurse's door, and and I had to call a what they call a first response, which is press a button on your radio, and every officer that's available will attend the scene. And I just remember I'm um, being what we called at the time pretzeled up, with the, the locks on and stuff. And for anybody that doesn't know, it's that it's a, it's part of a control and restraint procedure. And there's certain pressure you can put on. You can put on just a little bit of pressure, or you can put on a lot of pressure. And if you put on a lot of pressure, it's sore. It really is sore. And you've got one guy on this arm. You've got one guy in this arm. You've got a guy in your legs, and you've got a guy on your head. And I just remember the prisoner being escorted out under locks, and they just dragged his face right along the ground all the way up to what they called in Kilmarnock Jail, the, the SRU, the Separation and Reintegration Unit. It was a seg, segregation. Uh, and it was just kind of shipped out to another jail straight after that. But I just remember thinking after it happened and everything settled down, like, wow. Like, I've really got to be on my guard constant. Like, because sometimes you can get a bit kind of settled and you can let your guard down and, you're, you're just it's like it's just a job and whatever else but when you get an incident like that it just it brings you back up straight away we are right shock and I just had to constantly remind myself that this isn't a game it's like, these are proper criminals hardened criminals long term prisoners guys that are in for serious serious offences and you've just got to really be on your guard and watch what you're doing and I'm not a tall guy, I'm only five foot six. Um, so I was probably seen as an easy target um, to a lot of prisoners, especially prisoners that have got tendencies for violence and stuff like that. So um, I always made uh, an effort to be good with my mouth. And, and what I mean by that is be fair and straight down the line with guys. And I always felt like from the majority of prisoners, I, I gained quite a lot of respect for just being straight down the line. Uh, and I had to be because I, I, I won't be about that. I won't even pretend like these guys could have really seriously harmed me and there would have been nothing I could do about it because, as I said, I'm, I, I am a short guy, uh, five foot six. I don't really have too much about me. I'm, I, I've done a bit of boxing and things when I was younger, but if these guys wanted to, they could take real advantage. And there was quite a lot of situations where you were 
you were just one on one or one on two or three yourself and prisoners in certain situations. So I just always made made it my mission to be fair and be reasonable with them and I found that the majority of the time that it gained me a lot of respect and I, I'd like to think that I was quite respected and well liked amongst the, the prison population in Kilmarnock. So you said there was a lot of situations then. What was the next one? So just in in general, the one of the, one of the situations I came across was that that it was really like it just happened so quick. I'm like, oh my god, what the hell is going on here? I had then was on a shift myself. So at the the weekend in HMP Kilmarnock as a reception officer, um, you would be on shift on your own in reception Saturday and Sunday doing whatever duties was required in reception and anybody else that was booked on to work that weekend that worked in reception was dispersed to all different parts of the jail to cover things like sickness and holidays and stuff and I always remember being in um, reception this weekend uh, working on my own and basically what you're doing is you're going through prisoner requests um, if they want to in um, Kilmarnock Jail, they were allowed to wear their own clothes. They didn't have prison clothes. Um, well, they did. They, they had a prison T-shirt and a prison jumper when they were moving out with their, their wings and their holes. But when they were on their, their wings and their holes, they were just allowed to wear their own clothes. But they were only allowed a certain amount of T-shirts, a certain amount of tops, a certain amount of bottoms, a certain amount of trainers and stuff. So you would always get in reception requests for you to go up and maybe take a couple of t-shirts off them, a pair of trainers and a pair of jeans, put it into their storage and give them something out of their storage to replace it. So at the weekend, it's just mundane. It's just going through all these requests and trying to sort it out as best you can for the prisoners. And I remember, excuse me, there was a prisoner up in the, the SRU in the segregation unit at the time. I came across a request eh, for this prisoner. And, eh, it was, and the reason it stands out to me is it was a very unique and Un, it wasn't very common and this prisoner was um, transitioning from male to female um, it was a bit uh, a touchy story I think I, I won't mention his actual name but I think he wanted to be called Sarah or something like that and what had happened was is he'd been handed in um, uh, bras and vests and panties and pantyhose and stuff and um, I remember the request coming in and what I had to do was it's got to the segregation unit and speak to the segregation unit manager to make sure first of all that there was nothing um, going on up in the segregation unit that would A, prevent the prisoner from getting the things initially and if there was anything in the rules to state that while the prisoner was in there that they were even allowed it anyway. So I had went up and discussed it with the, the, the segregation unit manager and uh, he said, no, I don't see why not. Um, basically, I'll just tell you the truth. Basically, what they said is, is whatever that prisoner asks for, obviously within reason, just give it because it's too much of a bloody headache if you say no because they'll just cry discrimination and this, that and the rest of it and th that will be a just a whole headache that the prison doesn't need. So I went back down and uh, got the, the prisoner's stuff and uh, I took the, the stuff back up and it was like um, what we call tights or in America it's pantyhose um, and it was little uh, like G-strings and thongs and stuff and all this stuff for, 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 for the guy as far as I'm concerned at the time the guy was male it's like, but he said he was transitioning and he, he was trying and just before I finish the rest of the story this guy actually moved to a female jail this guy moved to a female jail and I, I, I really I'm not pretending there he, they allowed this guy to move to a female jail uh, and I won't even tell you the crime that he was in for initially either um, but you can imagine anyway um, he Hey, do you know what that sound means? Ooh, that's something I've been hearing a lot lately. I can't help but love that. 
That's what I hear when I make another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. The Pokemon business I've recently started with someone is absolutely thriving thanks to Shopify. Shopify accepts all kinds of payments and sometimes it's complex when you get on a platform, but their dashboard makes it completely simple. Covering all your sales channels from a shopfront ready POS system to its all in one e commerce platform. Shopify even gets you selling across social media marketplaces like Facebook, Insta, TikTok, and YouTube. Full of the industry leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without learning new skills in design or coding. And thanks to award winning help and with an extensive business course library, Shopify is ready to support your success every step of the way. So when it comes to dealing with people all over the world, Shopify is absolutely enabling us to smash it with our Pokemon business. Before Shopify, our Pokemon card business was in the dark ages. It's time to get serious about selling and get Shopify today. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, all lowercase. Go to shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.co.uk slash Sean. Link in description box below this video on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Back to the podcast. Was allowed out the next day for um, to collect his lunch from the survey and the the segregation unit, and he used the the panty holes the, the, the panty holes to attack the the prisoner that was serving his um his meal, and the prisoner ended up in a coma. Uh, and in hospital uh, for some months, I, I can't remember how long, but and I just always re remember feeling guilty and like I was always remember feel, thinking what questions are coming my way about this because if we go back to what I said earlier about making up to make sure that everything was okay and there was nothing in the rules to stipulate that this prison prisoner shouldn't receive these items, like the the, the answer I got was like just whatever cheeky, whatever it is, whatever they want, just give it to them because it's not worth the headache if they make a complaint. And I just always remember in the back of my head thinking, have I done something wrong here? Is there something going to come back on me about this? But it never did. It never did, fortunately. But just crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. So how on earth did that person get moved to a female prison? Did he have his gear stick removed? Uh, as far as my will, no. No. But I do know that they was on... Um, I don't know what the the medication is. Is it estrogen or hormone, some sort of ho hormonal medication or stuff? I know they had started the process for that, and um, I know he's, the gear stick was still there, but it was it was growing breasts um, with the medication and stuff that um, it was on. So it wasn't a full transition, but it was kind of halfway there where you could probably say they could go all the way or they could come back the way. But I know that he was moved to a, a, a female uh, prison, uh, but that was after my time. That was after my time in jail. I mean, we've interviewed Sarah Jane Baker, longest serving trans prisoner in the UK. Um, she's an absolute riot. And even she says that the prisoners, like what you've just described, shouldn't go to the female prison. They should have their own separate, because then you've got the problems of, what could possibly happen to the female yeah. prisoners? In, in yeah. we've seen situations arise. Well, absolutely, I, I'm, I fully agree with that. I think there should be a separate establishment uh, for things like that. There was a big, huge um, uproar in the local press up in Scotland um, just towards the end of last year, where a, a prisoner that had been convicted of rape and decided that he was going to identify as a female in the Scottish government were. I think in the process of approving the application for this prisoner to go to a female jail and there was a stop put to it eventually, but you think how can the cases like this even get as far as that? It should be thrown out straight away, especially when you consider the crime. It's like what you said, gone to an extreme. They just don't want the aggro. Yeah. So what about high-profile prisoner stories? Yeah, so <laughs> there was a... a a couple of high-profile prisoners in HMP Kilmarnock. Um, and what I mean is, is certainly high-profile prisoners in Scotland. Um, there was a guy 
on what we called Hector Wing, which is where all the protections were. Um, for obviously guys that are in on sex cases and stuff like that. And the guy's name was Alexander Pacto. And he was a young man and he was convicted of um, abducting, I think, rape and dismemberment of a student nurse from Ireland called Karen Buckley. Um, there's a few uh, documentaries about it on YouTube. Um, but his name was Alexander Pacto. And uh, this guy was the epiphany. It was just, this guy was evil. You could see it in his eyes. There was nothing behind his eyes. It was horrendous to deal with because it was very, very, very intelligent. Very intelligent. He had a privileged upbringing compared to probably 95% of the, the, the population in jail in the respect that his parents were really very quite well off. They ran their own business and stuff. He was brought up on in a very affluent uh, neighbourhood in the, the West End of Glasgow. Um, he had, his education came via private school and different things like that. But just a couple of years prior to this offence, he, he had been um, at court on a, a charge that was he was found not proven. So in Scotland, they've got a a, a charge or a, a process in court where you can be found not proven. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not guilty. It just means that basically that they know or they think it was you, but they just can't prove it. Yeah, there's not enough evidence. So the, the warning signs and everything were there for this guy. But um, I think a lot of his problems stem from rejection from girls when he was growing up because he, he wasn't a very particularly good looking guy. He was very tall and when he first came to jail he was quite um, overweight as well. But um, he'd been in the papers a few times throughout his stay in Kilmarnock jail because uh, I think it must have been prisoners that had been feeding the stories because they were mm. absolute rubbish. That the things that the papers were reporting just wasn't the case at all. Um, they, they were basically saying that they, it was bullying people on the wing and uh, it was trying to take guys' medication off them and their canteen things off them and different stuff like that, but it wasn't the case. Uh, one of the reports in the the, uh, the press was that he'd uh, started a riot in the jail as well and he smashed the place up and he was assaulting staff and this, that and the rest of it. And basically what had happened was is he was told that he He'd asked for something and he was told no, and he kicked his own TV off his desk in his cell, and that was it. Just a horrendous big guy, but it was one of these guys that no, it was like a very unique case in the respect that like, even the horrible people that he was sharing a wing with didn't like him. It was that bad. It was just a, an absolute seclus, and he used to because it was quite because he was quite tall and stuff, he used to kind of swagger about his, his, uh, his hall and his, his, his wing and stuff, and he would act the big man, and nobody would really see anything to him. And then, um, I, in fact, I told you a, a slight lie earlier on, that there's only one situation in prison, well, commander jail anyway, that the general population and protection prisoners will come across each other, and it's at visits. It's been that having visits, and I always remember him, and that's why I'm saying that because I just remembered about him being on his visits, and he would be there, but they would have to put him at one particular table right next to where the officers sat, and it, the only person in his family that would ever come and visit him was his grandmother, and she was disabled, and she used to wheel her wheelchair up, and he just used to sit like that and face the ground for the whole visit, because he was obviously ashamed of it why he was there and what he had done and couldn't ever speak about it to anybody. Just a horrible, horrible creature. Horrible guy. Wow, that's mind-blowing. The, the, the lengths that that guy went to to try and cover up his crimes as well. He, he was caught on CCTV and being q and things, um, picking up different acids and industrial cleaners and stuff. And he'd cut up the young girl's body and put it into a barrel and... Um, he put it. He put the barrel out on a bit of 
in a like a unit that he rented off a farmer out in a farm, and he just left it at the rock. Just a horrible, horrible, horrible person. Oh, I can't horrible. imagine what a par- what yeah. parents the family went through. That's disgusting. Yeah. There was another guy in um, Kilmarnock as well, and I won't mention his name. Uh, and the only reason I say that is because I know that he's pretty well connected on the outside and he still will be, so I won't mention his name. But this guy, he was very, very, very high profile in uh, Scotland for his crime. And the reason I say that is because I think him and his co-defendant or his co-accused were the only two people who ever receive a maximum life sentence for a murder where the, the, the body was never, ever found. They'd never, ever found the body. And usually in a, a murder case, they need to find the, the body to prove that the murder's actually taking place. But these were the two first, um, the two two people forever in Scottish criminal history to be sentenced or tried and sentenced to um, life in jail for a murder where the body was never, ever found. And they, they got, well, the, the, the guy that I dealt with and came across in HMP Kilmarnock was... It was sentenced to life with a, a minimum term of 30 years. That is very un, unusual. Did they have yeah. some kind of um, witness uh, testimony against them or something? Yes, they had a couple. So what had happened was is the case was, I'll speak a little bit about the case. I don't want to say too much because it won't be too hard to work out who I'm talking about. But the case was um, a, a young female from the Glasgow area who was posing as a big time financial advisor and investor and stuff and I think she had um, she was a, basically a con artist and uh, she had kind of sold this guy's friend uh, an investment um, thing uh, down in I think it was just outside Manchester Airport for property development and it was just a whole made up story and it was for quite a lot of money and the guy and his his friend had abducted or kidnapped her up in Glasgow and taken them taken the female to a a house about thirty miles outside Glasgow and they had a kind of tied to a chair in a, an attic and they'd two guys looking after her but they they properly tortured her and I mean like pulling teeth out and cutting fingernails off and all different things like that. And the reason that they know this is because the two guys, but who they called the babysitters, had obviously turned against them and uh, gave evidence and statements as to what had happened. Um, and they could only go off of the, those witness statements because there was obviously no evidence because there was nobody. But everybody kind of knew what had happened. But they, they, without finding a body, they were convicted and sentenced to, to life and a minimum term of 30 years, which was virtually unheard of at the time. Any other high-profile ones you came across? Uh, not that I can think of. There is a couple of, a couple of other prisoners in there that I came across, but it, at this moment in time, it's not really something that I would be comfortable talking about. And the only reason I say that is because they're very, very high-profile in Glasgow and they're still very, very active out in the, the community. So... Um, maybe for another time. Yep. So so far in your story, then, had you encountered any like riot situations or anything like that? No, there, there wasn't really any uh, riots as such. There was the, the odd situation where uh, maybe a handful of prisoners would try and start what you would call a riot, or the proper terminology in prison, they would call it a concerted and discipline, um, but. It never, it never really came in. The, the, the one thing I will say about um, the staff in the, the, the private jails is that they're, they're on the ball and they, they tend to get things under control very quickly. But there isn't really anything as bad as that. I would just like to go back a wee bit um, about not long after I came back to work after the situation with the, the prisoners and the two female officers. Um, as I said earlier on, after all that situation had happened, I had a huge target in my back and stuff. And I could tell that they were really out to get me because 
at every opportunity they could get, they would um, come and pull me in for random drug tests and, and different things like that. And I remember on one occasion they, they, they pulled me in for a for a random drugs test and I actually failed it and I failed it for all. And the reason I had failed it for all was because at the time I was prescribed um, Cocodamol from a doctor. And for anyone that doesn't know, if you take any sort of codeine and stuff, if if you can't, if you if you do a drugs test, it, it will flag up for. Um, but they they done this one day, and I just seen, um, the prison manager's face absolutely light up, as if they say, finally we've got this, we've got this guy, and I was like, oh, I, I I really wanted to swear, but I'll refrain at the moment. Um, so <laughs> what had happened was is they um. He's like whipped my radio and my keys and everything off me and gave them to the guy that had carried out the test and he marched me to the gatehouse and put me off the premises. And he made me go and stand at the window at the gatehouse and he went into the gatehouse and told the staff, under no circumstances, under no circumstances whatsoever do you let that guy back on these premises. And I had to drive home thinking, what the what the hell has just happened? I had to go back home and I had to tell my missus and every day that I, I've been suspended because I failed a drugs test and everybody's like, how the hell have you failed a drugs test? And I just didn't have any answers for them. And I was at home for 10 days suspended thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? So basically what the jail had done was is, is they'd sent my, it was a urine sample um, that I'd done, it was a, a urine test and they'd sent it to the, the lab and it's obviously came back for the lab. They'd obviously broke it down to see exactly what was contained in it and stuff. And it came back that it was Cocodamol. And I was able to provide a prescription for it. Um, so I was in the house, suspended for about 10 days. And they finally called me to come back in for a meeting with the, the head of security at the time. And you could just see that they were absolutely seething beyond belief that they had to basically take like, tell me that everything was fine and they gave me a really terrible apology, like tail between the leg, kind of, I don't want to do this, but I've got to basically said sorry and uh, we would like it if you came back to work and all this kind of stuff, which I did do. Um, I don't know why, but I did. But after that, it was just the most horrendous experience in place to, to work and be in. It was just unbelievable. And it kicked off a whole array of different problems for myself in respect of my mental health and different things like that because I really had nobody at that point in the whole prison eh, in the respect of the staff had all been told or been speaking about me had been having been marched off the premises and he's been taking drugs so I wonder what else he's been doing and he must be corrupt and this, that and the rest of it. And it was just horrendous. And a lot of the staff in the jail behind my back had started calling me Charlie, um, referring to obviously white um, stuff. They never say, not a lot of them said it to my face, but they, they would all call me behind my back and everybody would always make snide remarks and comments. And I just felt like I was just constantly being watched and I, I couldn't just be left alone to get carry on with my job and different things like that and it was just absolutely horrendous. The treatment I got after that was was nothing short of just a hundred percent bullying. And it it's caused me even to this day, it's caused me problems with um anxiety and stuff and being able to trust people at, at their word and things like that. It's been horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. I had so to I go off see, sick could... and then I could, I could, you know, I could see that going two ways. Um, your attitude could be resentful. Why am I even working here? You know, the people who are supposed to be on my side are against me. Yeah. Or you, it could be like, you know, f you to those guys. I'm just gonna buckle down and show show them that. Um, That's exactly what I tried to do, Sean. I tried to kind of just put, kind of put my, my head down and go on. But I knew that I was good at my job. I knew that I could do my job. I knew that I had the respect from the prisoners, like I'd mentioned earlier, because I treated them fairly, um, and 
anything that they were entitled to with me, they got it. Um, I never had a problem with anybody, uh, prisoner-wise in there. But it just got to the point where it was just far too much and they just made it impossible for me to be able to go in and do my job the way I should have been allowed to do it. Um, it was just, I just always felt like they were constantly on my case for a lot of things and on my, my case for things that I didn't do as well. I was getting the blame for things that I didn't do. Like after those situations, like the guys that I worked with in my department and reception, I mean, one day I came in, I was pulled in by the security team because one of my colleagues in reception had put white powder, it was soap powder, but they'd put white powder in a clear plastic bag and put it in my drawer at my desk in reception. And security had done a random security check and found it and they were trying to do me for having uh, Class A uh, drugs at work with me and all different things like that. Uh, one of the other officers that I worked with had um, taken... Uh, some things out of a prisoner's property box and put it in my drawer. And I was, they were trying to do me for um, stealing for prisoners, stealing off prisoners and different things like that. They just made it absolutely impossible for me to go. Like, I, it got to the stage where I was waking up in the morning and I was just so worried and anxious about what I was going into face on that particular day. And it just got all too much and I ended up having to go off sick just to... to bring myself back a bit and kind of recharge and refocus and different things like that. But it so happened that once I went off, um, after that, it, it, uh, it, I never went back. Um, they did send staff out to my house and things to try and hound me. Just going back a bit then, Martin. So the officers who planted those things in your property, did they get reprimanded? No. No, it, what had happened was is that it, it was all right when it was discovered what had happened because it was just guys having a laugh. But it wasn't a laugh to me. It wasn't a laugh to me when I'm getting pulled in and questioned about it. And I don't, I, I can't, I've got no explanation as to why it stayed or how it got there and things like that. But oh, a, a week later, oh, it's all right, we, we found out what happened. So, so and so uh, put it in for a laugh, like, thinking that you would find it. So it's all right. It's we won't take it any further, but but it's all right for me to be worried sick for the last week being under investigation for something I haven't got a clue about. Come on, it doesn't add up. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the interview we did with um, John Sutton. He's got a book out, yeah. HMP Manchester Prison Officer. He said that they went against him so hard, they basically set him up to get killed in there. It doesn't surprise me, Sean. It honestly doesn't surprise me. The power in things that senior staff members in these establishments have got is scary, especially when you actually see what what type of people a lot of them are. Um, it's like, like I, 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 I honestly, in the maybe six months to a year after finishing working in there, I honestly on a weekly basis thought to myself, I'm actually so lucky that I haven't found myself on the other side of the bars in there through no fault of mine just because I had a target on my back and basically my face didn't fit. But when I was off on the sick, they'd sent uh, prison managers out to my, my house to hound me to try and force a resignation out of me and everything. It was just horrendous. Even when I was at home, I was still being harassed. Horrendous. All right, well, before we go to you leaving it then, let, let's just go back a bit because I've still got a few yeah. more questions. Yeah, How yeah. long... How long were you an officer for? Yeah, so I was uh, all in all, including my training and stuff. I was just just short of four years. Just and four years. during your career, did you ever encounter Chris McPherson, our friend? Yes, Chris. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, shout out to Chris, by the way. Um, Indeed, uh, having me on his podcast, he's uh, a really, really nice guy, and uh, I'm sure he won't mind me telling this story. When I first uh, started at HMP Kilmarnock. There was only two prisoners that the staff had warned us about to be on our guard with. One was a, a well-known prisoner in the Scottish prison system called Porky. And the other guy, the other guy was Chris. Um, Chris was funny when you got to know him, but a scary, scary character to see out and about on the halls and on the wing and stuff because he had a, 
a persona, like a like a hard man scowling face persona, and he would walk about with a swagger and the chest pumped out, and he would just absolutely tank into the, the the new the rookies, the new staff and stuff. He used to uh, kind of hound them, and he would whenever a new rookie pres- prison officer came onto the wing, he would he would just kind of hound them and scound them and they'd, they'd shout things like ooh fresh meat fresh meat <laughs> and, and, but it was it was it, it honestly it was scary but that, that was his persona on the wing see when he was inside his cell as such or at education and stuff a very very likeable and highly highly intelligent guy people don't give him enough credit for doing the things that he done yeah, education wise when he was in jail because He's actually got a degree, Chris, uh, that he obtained whilst he was in jail. And I must say, to do a degree, even as a free person out in the community where there's loads and loads of aids and help for you, must be hard. But to do it in that setting, with all the challenges and things that a prisoner would face inside, it's hats off to him. An absolute credit to himself and his family. And uh, I'm just really glad to see him out and staying out and doing so well and Obviously, his channel and stuff's taken off on here, and I'm obviously thankful for him having me on because you had obviously seen it, Sean, and invited me on your show as well. So, um, yeah, a big shout out to Chris because uh, what a guy and what a turnaround for the guy I first met in HMP Kilmarnock all those years, all those years ago. Uh, what he's doing now, uh, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he's an excellent writer as well, and he's working on his he book. Is. So we look forward. Yeah. To that, to that coming out. So, you know, l- looking back, Martin, at those years, were, were there any, like, funny moments or, you know, you, you, nostalgic moments? There's a lot of doom and gloom, but... Yeah, no, there's... I mean, there's, there's loads of uh, funny moments and stuff. Um, I always remember... <laughs> the, the funniest thing about uh, me working in HMP Kilmarnock was... Um, it's... HMP Kilmarnock's right on my doorstep. It's literally seven minutes in my car from my house to the prison. So, as I said earlier on, there was a lot of short-term prisoners and stuff eh, and remand prisoners and stuff in HMP Kilmarnock. So, I used to see quite a lot of prisoners out uh, about in the community after they'd served their, their sentences and they would always recognise me. Um, absolute nightmare when you're out with your family because they would be... They, like, they'll... they'll, they'll, they'll can I recognise you from across the street or in a shopping centre or something like that and they'll be shouting and swearing and like, yeah, you, yeah, remember in there you never gave me this and you never done that and all that carry on. But uh, I remember one guy, one guy uh, he, was in, he was a short-term prisoner, but can I, on the longer-term side of a short-term sentence, if you understand what I mean, and... Uh, I remember meeting him about four or five months after he was uh, liberated for HMP Kilmarnock and he came up behind me, put his arm round uh, my neck, like in a chokehold, but it, there was no pressure and he was like, put his fingers to my head and he's like, ah, you, you remember me, you remember me? And obviously I've, myself, somebody's come up behind me and I thought, oh no, what have I done, what have I done? And he let me go and he turned round and he's like, ah, he'd always, he was under the influence of drink or something, but it was so funny. And he put his arms around me, he's like, all right, me man. And he's um, shaking me up and down and stuff. And he's like, and then he's away again. He's like, is that money I can hear in your pocket? And I'm like, I will be. He's like, you couldn't lend me a fiver for a packet of fags, could you? <laughs> I was like, if somebody sees me gain new money out in the street, so I eh, just crazy, just because it's such a a a, a small area, kind of round about HMP Kilmarnock, and I live so close, I, I kind of bump into prisoners all the time. It's it's funny a lot of the time, but some of the times it's quite embarrassing, especially if they're trying to speak to you the way they would speak to you in there when there's members of the public about and stuff. But um, the hardest thing for me. Um, working in there was um, the town where I live for a time there maybe a few years ago they were sending a lot of guys uh, up to living flats up here after they were released for jail and 
I, I found myself stuck between a rock and a hard place because I was starting to recognise a lot of guys coming out of the jail and moving into the town where I live that were sex offenders. Mm. And I was obligated not to say anything to anybody. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm moving these guys round the corner from primary schools and in areas where there's young kids and stuff. And um, it, that was really difficult. I ended up having to warn people that I knew that lived in close proximity to them. Just like, look, that guy, as much as he's done his time, that's what he, he, he's done his time for. And that this is this guy's uh, history. So just be on your guard round about him. That was the hardest thing, was seeing these guys moving in uh, my community where my kids grow up and where my kids play and live. So it was horrendous. Like, And it just goes to show like how many people don't know that that's the type of person that's living in the street or living next door. The only reason like I the, knew is because I knew them from before. And the government doesn't prioritise these people as criminals. They should get life sentences to harm they cause. No. Here is a word from today's sponsor, Aura. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers. You can use my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash aura dot com. Aura is A-U-R-A forward slash Sean Atwood, S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T Wood to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info. Also linked in my description box on this YouTube version or scan the QR code on the screen. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. How long were you on reception for then? So basically I was on reception I was assigned to reception just about my whole time. And oh, was you? But, okay. Yeah, yeah, but like I, I, going back to what I was saying earlier on, like there was only ever one reception officer needed for reception shifts when you were booked on to work the weekends. So whenever I was working the weekends and it wasn't my shift for reception, they would move you to different parts of the jail. So basically I got to work in every area of the jail. I worked in the long-term house blocks, I worked in the short-term house blocks, I worked in the segregation unit, I worked at the work units, I worked in education, I worked in healthcare. I just, I, I was able to experience just about every part of the jail, which was good because it kind of mixed it up a little bit and I got to know a hell of a lot of people. All right, you've run through all of those quite quickly. Let's go through them one by one then. Yeah. So what was the first other part of the jail you got to work in? So the first other part of the jail I got to work in was the short-term house block, and in particular, um, hotel wing, which was where all the protections were kept, all the um, the sex offenders and people that had been in for horrible offences. So we say we'll not name them or go into them because they are they are horrible. And as much as a prison itself is a very unique environment, when you go into that. It's just a whole different feeling and horrible place to work within an already challenging setting. Um, and it's like as much as you should never judge a book by its cover and you should never prejudge people um, and people will always probably have a stereotypical image of what they think these particular people look like. Nine times out of ten, you're probably right. Nine times out of ten, you're probably right. And you shouldn't ever judge somebody just by how they look, but you can just tell these guys are horrible, horrible people just by looking at them. And the one thing I'll say about guys on these wings, they tend to be um, less... I'm trying to think how to put it politely. Um, their personal hygiene, let's just say, leaves a lot to be desired. Okay. Um, you do find that a lot of prisoners um, respect their own space. They like to have it nice and clean and tidy and their personal hygiene. They're always on top of it and stuff. But 
on the, these particular places, not so much. Not so much. Just horrible, horrible, horrible places. And you can just see, like, I personally, in my opinion, these guys, if you're in jail for a certain crime, then I think each individual should be kind of kept separate for everybody. They shouldn't be allowed to congregate and communicate and exercise with other people. It, it, it should just be like one huge segregation unit for these guys and they shouldn't be allowed contact with anybody else because I almost felt like you, all these guys go into prison and they go into one area and it's just like they join this big club and they get to share and discuss different things and stories and you can see it happening. You can't prove it, but you can see it happening right in front of you and there's nothing you can do about it. Horrible, horrible place. But in Kilmarnock, there's two separate main, main house blocks and it was house block one and house block two. House block one was for the long-term prisoners and house block two were for remand and short-term prisoners. And I always, I've always said that I preferred working in house block one because it was a lot more quiet and laid back and stuff because all these guys are in for quite a number of years, as, as it says on the tin, they're long-term prisoners, so they're, they're there for a long while. So these guys are just in a routine and they're just getting their heads down and doing their time and, and it's nice and quiet and relaxed and stuff because basically these guys know they're in for years, so that's their house type thing. Whereas over in another house block, it was just a, a jungle, while the revolving dory guys come in and out and people coming in still under the influence of drugs or people coming off drugs because they've just come in or alcohol or, and just absolute carnage wild over in that that uh, area of the jail. And also what I will say is, is my, from my experience and my time at HMP Kilmarnock at that time, was there was a huge epidemic of uh, prisoners using the synthetic cannabis stuff, the spice, uh, the, st the things that that drug done to guys in jail was like you would never believe. It was absolutely horrendous. It was the worst thing to ever hit Scottish and UK jails as far as I'm concerned. What did it, you see? Oh, horrendous, Sean. Absolutely horrendous. That This drug just gripped these guys, and I mean gripped them. And once it had a hold of them, it didn't, it just it, it take, pardon the pun, it took no prisoners. It sent normal guys um, down a dangerous path where a lot of these guys were having to be moved on to um, like, uh, secure hospitals because they were just absolutely gone in the head. The amount of um, people that were collapsing and overdosing and choking in their own vomit and and the violence and stuff that it caused was ridiculous. But in particular, the guys that were normal guys, and you see them over the course of a short period of time changing from normal guys to absolutely going in the head. There was guys thinking that there was people coming in and putting microchips in them, and there was people putting devices in cells and in walls and stuff to keep track of them, and they ended up just paranoid schizophrenics because of this supposedly legal high. And it was, or what they call it in the prison system is NPS. It's a new psycho psychoactive substances. And they've actually got um, machines now that can detect it because it's that bad. The jails are paying up to £75,000 for one machine just to detect it. That's how bad the problem is. You're saying it, that can test the P for it? No, no. So the way that the prisoners and stuff were getting this substance in was it, they, they, they must have had it in liquid form out on the street. And what they were doing was is when the prisoners were getting mail sent in, the, the stamp that was on the letter, they were dipping the stamp in the, the liquid form of this synthetic cannabinoid and sticking the stamp to the letter and posting the letter to the prisoner. And the prisoner was then able to take the stamp off the letter and just break it up into tiny pieces and put it into like a roll up cigarette and then smoke it. And they were, I remember being in the vicinity of just the fumes of it and the effects that it had on me 
just be like second hand passive smoking and inhaling the fumes. What it must have been doing to them when it was going straight into their system, uh, that was frightening, absolutely frightening. And it actually got that bad in Scottish jails that prisoners, if unless it's um, legal correspondence, they don't get the um, master's copies of their mail anymore. Every bit of correspondence that comes in out with legal correspondence is photocopied and then given to the prisoners now to try and eradicate it because it's not much of a problem. So these machines, how do they detect it? So basically what you do is is the you take a swab of the letters in the paperwork that come in and then you put the sample inside the machine and the machine could flashes up and tells you um, if the MPS or SPICE or whatever it is is contained within the sample that you've produced. But it's specifically just for that. They have, all prisons have obviously got these machines at the gatehouse that will test for an array of different substances. This one is just particularly for this um, NPS or new psychoactive substances. Um, just because it's so so bad, it took a grip of the jails like I've nothing I've ever seen before. So quite often it's like an arms race, isn't it, whereby the prisoners figure a way to bring it in and then yeah. the jail figures a way to counteract it yeah. and then the prisoners f- uh, figure out another way. Is that what yeah. happened in this case? Oh, 100%. Because initially when this stuff first came about, it, it actually looked like green. It came like in as a, like you would expect a bag of green to come in. But they kept on changing the chemical makeup of the, the drug because going back to what what it was called, it was called a, a legal high. So it was legal. The actual chemical makeup of the drug wasn't illegal. But what this the, the, the government and things were doing was they were making certain concoctions or chemical elements together illegal. But what the they were then doing to counteract it was is they were just slightly changing the chemical makeup of these uh, things so that if they were caught with it, yes, it could be confiscated, but they could they wouldn't receive any criminal charges because it's not illegal because of the chemical makeup of it. So I think eventually they've went from a synthetic green type substance to a liquid substance. And I think I even heard a story of um, some of the prisons down, uh, down south, um, it, it became that the guys were getting this stuff in, but they were also getting paper that was doused in WD-40 oil, and they preferred smoking the paper with the, the WD-40 oil rather than the synthetic cannabis. Crazy. What was the craziest thing you ever saw someone do after smoking that, of taking it? Uh, the, the craziest thing that I saw we are prisoner after um, that got a grip on him was the cell farm. Um, I, w- I was actually quite, I, I don't want to say friendly, but I was quite, the prisoner in question that I'm talking about, I was his personal officer, so each officer's got a certain amount of prisoners and you're determined that they're, that they're personal officer. So they'll, in the first instance, come to you with any problems or anything like that. This guy was so bad on this stuff that he was put on what they call a permanent watch, where there had to be an officer at his cell door 24 hours a day watching them because it was so bad with cell farming. Um, but these prisoners have still got some rights and things that they're entitled to. And this guy was so bad that he was in a cell with, like, he didn't even have a mattress. He had the, like, um, cell farm uh, clothing on, the, the pyjamas stuff that you can't rip or anything like that so that they can't harm themselves with it. But one thing that a prisoner's entitled to and you just point blank can't refuse um, is a phone call. Is a, is a phone call. So this particular guy was on a permanent watch where there was a prison officer at his door every day. But this particular day, he, was a, he got out like he did every other day for his phone call. And he went and made his phone call at the phone, and the prison officer that was watching him that day had obviously just taken his eyes off him for one minute whilst he was on the phone, and the guy just hung, hung up the phone, 
and then he just ran right up the stairs onto the top flat on the hall and just dived right off the top flat, head first into the floor. And that's the uh, horrendous, horrendous. And it just, it, and and it, the, the thing that made him do it was just pure paranoia. And it all stemmed from his use of these, uh, these horrible, horrible substances. What kind of damage did he do to himself? Uh, he was very, very lucky. Very, very lucky. He chipped a bone in his neck and he damaged a couple of discs in his lower back. And other than superficial cuts and bruises and grazes, he was actually... He came out of it a lot better than you would have expected. Um, because in uh, HMP Kilmarnock, it's just it's one flight, so they don't have any like nets or anything like that. They don't have any safety nets or anything like that because it's just one flight of stairs on the halls. But it's high enough that if you jump off head first, you've got to do yourself some serious damage. And he's lucky he came out of that with just the injuries that he had. Very lucky indeed. Is it like a, a case where they're just so out of it, like they wake up the next day all injured and they don't even realise what they've done? Is it like that? Yeah, yeah. The amount of times that... Um, Officers were shouted to responses on the radio because these guys were lying on their backs, choking in their vomit. Um, just, and it's just because they're that out of it that they don't have any control over their body or what's happening. As much as possibly they might mentally in their head know exactly what's happening round about them, the effects of the, 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 the drugs are as such that they don't have any control over their body or what's happening, but they might be all there mentally. And then over a period of time, mentally, they start to change and they don't have any control over their body or their mind when they're on it. And it just, it doesn't make for a great experience. It's absolutely horrendous. It's honestly, like I said earlier, the worst thing to ever hit the jails. What about attacks on staff members, either after smoking that or just for any other reasons? Uh, I didn't, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, Sean, I didn't see very many attacks on prison officers and probably the main reason for that was is because the majority of the staff within the prison at Kilmarnock were kind of I wouldn't say well liked but a lot of the staff in Kilmarnock were, were rookie prison officers the, the, turn, the turnover of the staff in the place was astronomical so I think the prisoners basically got away with doing what they wanted to do within reason. So there wasn't really much need to be attacking the staff. I've always said since leaving Kamala, the only reason that place runs and is still running is on the goodwill of the prisoners because really because of the the rawness and the the turnover of staff and the amount of new staff that are in that place, if they prisoners wanted to con- take control of that establishment, they could. No problem. No problem. Were weapons a problem? Yeah. I mean, I think it's just the same as in every jail. Um, you're always going to come across weapons. Uh, like I said, I didn't often see any weapons being used, but when you do things like cell searches or security checks and different things like that that you always come across weapons and it's it's always the same type of um weapons where it's plastic cutlery that have, it's been pointed down into a point at the end or it's uh maybe a blade a razor blade that's been melted into the end of a toothbrush and then thread wrapped around it for the grip different things like that and i think it, it, particularly in hmp kamalak the Weapons aren't specifically made to be used, but probably just more for protection rather than made specifically for a specific attack on a specific person. So if you're searching in your cell and you find a weapon, what's the punishment then for the prisoner? So the, the, with Kilmarnock being a private jail, what you would do is, is you would put the prisoner on report and you would obviously sleeve up the weapon for evidence and what would happen is, is the prisoner would go to what they call the adjudication room, which was located in the segregation unit at Kilmarnock, and you would go up in front of what they would call an SPS controller. So it would be like a, a governor from the Scottish Prison Service, 
and he would do the adjudication and it would be down to him it would, as to what the um what the what, what kind of charging uh, punishment the prisoner would receive depending on what the prisoner was up on report for. Generally speaking, if a prisoner was up for being in possession of a weapon, they would probably get something like 14 days loss of privileges, i.e. they would have their TV um, taken off them and stuff, and they'd probably be put on a rule for three of those days where they were locked up for 23 hours a day. And in HMP Kilmarnock, they had a, like a tier system for prisoners. They had basic, standard, and enhanced. So, like, basic prisoners, for instance, at during the week and at the weekend would probably be locked up, say, at six o'clock. And then a standard prisoner would be locked up at half six. An enhanced prisoner would be locked up at, say, seven, quarter past seven. I don't I, I don't mean it, it was specific day times, but that's just how the tier system worked. And if you were put on report and you had a loss of privileges, if you were, say, an enhanced prisoner, and that would mean you would be bumped straight back down to basic. And that could be the difference between having an extra 15, 17 hours out your cell a week or being banged up for an extra 15 to 17 hours a week because you've been bumped down with the heavy tier system. So it's I think the punishments in HMP Kilmarnock were quite good because it was a really big deterrent for guys, um, especially having their TVs and stuff taken off them and being banged up early. Especially at the weekend. Another that was another one of the jobs that you were tasked to do, uh, working in the jail as well, would be accompanying um, prisoners to adjudication um, up the segregation unit, um, and it was basically for the protection of the SPS controllers. So basically, you would sit with the prisoner. The prisoner would sit at the desk, and you would have a prison officer either either side, and you would have a hand on his shoulder and a hand on his forearm so that he couldn't move out the seat when he was given his punishment, because a lot of guys really didn't take too kindly to being told that they were going to be getting banged up for 23 hours a day and their TV taking off them type thing. So uh, that was another experience as well. So with weapons then, they don't get an extra charge and, and like time yeah. added? Unless unless they've actually used the weapon, they wouldn't receive a civilian charge. It would just be... And done in house, and it would be like a restriction of pr privileges and things like that. Were there any hostage situations? No, there was. I, I never ever came across. I heard about them in other jails, but personally, I didn't experience uh, any situations like that. Whilst I worked there. So, there was a few other areas you said you worked that we haven't covered. Was it medical visitation? So I, worked, it? I worked at um, the healthcare department, and what I mean by that is, is um, it's like part of my duties as well as being a a reception officer. If if ever I was on the day shift, the very first thing you would do um, in the morning would be to go and collect all the prisoners that are going out of the jail that day. Um, and any prisoners that were going out had to go via the healthcare department first to get their medication before they went out. So it was things like that. But 90% of the time it was just guys going to the healthcare department to get their methadone which right. is a huge population of the jail. Is that, that. Tra is, that, is that used as currency? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I noticed guys doing it all the time, just banking it. You know I mean, they would have maybe something like uh, the biggest the, the biggest one I remember, or the, the, the cleverest one I remember seeing was an empty pen casing, like mm. a bit with, with, without the, the actual, uh, the, without the nib and the tube the ink inside it. And if the guy was taking his methadone and then just spitting it back into the pen and putting chewing gum on the end of it to seal it inside, and then he would sell it when he went back up onto the, onto the wing. What about visitation, strip searches? Did you, did you ever get assigned to that? Uh, so I'd done quite a lot of shifts in the visits department, especially at the weekends, um, if I was booked on and I wasn't working at the reception. So it would be a case of uh, searching... Uh, obviously all the visitors and things when they were coming in and searching the prisoners coming in and out of the visits uh, room. So uh, there was quite a few times where we were rolling about with prisoners down there because they were trying to score on their visit packages and stuff. And um, nine times out of ten, it, it, these guys were so determined to get these packages and 
not because they wanted or needed to take them. It was obviously because they had owed people elsewhere in the jail and they were trying to get their stuff in to pay off their debts and stuff. Uh, so it was always a big thing to watch out for at visits because it's where 90% of the, the contraband comes in through the jails, through the visits. And the amount of times we had to phone the police for to come and take away civilians because they were trying to smuggle things in, it was on a daily basis. So the visitors end up with a street case and they'd end up in the prison after trying to smuggle something in? Yeah, dep- obviously depending on what it was they were trying to smuggle in, the quantity of it and if they'd ever been if it had any previous for doing the same, but nine times out of nine times out of ten a, a civilian would uh, gain a custodial sentence for trying to smuggle into the jail. It, they, they do have signs at the gatehouse telling them that. So in America, you know, they've got the sniffer dogs on the visitors coming in, they've got the pat downs, the prisons themselves, the strip searches are quite invasive. Is it you know equally there's a lot of measures like that that you experienced? So- so yeah, in Kilmarnock they did. They had a, a dog unit as well, and every single prisoner eh, visitor that came in would be set stopping down with the dogs. Every single one, without fail, um, and it'd be the same on the, the prisoners coming in to the visits department. The dogs would be there, um, sniffing up and down to make sure, um, especially obviously when they're coming back off the visits to go back up into into the jail. But um, yeah, it was. I'm just trying to, I, I, I thought of something there to, to say and it's completely went out of my head. Um, so they sat at a table with the visitor, is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. Some levels, some levels you're behind plexiglass in America. Well, there is, there is certain situations where um, there is booths where prisoners may, may be on what they would call closed visits and that will be, for example, because previously they've been trying to uh, smuggle contraband back in and stuff and um, they'll be on what they would call close visits for a period of time as a punishment so they wouldn't have any uh, like personal or f- close contact with their, their visitors for a period of time and hopefully it's it's enough of a deterrent to, to stop them doing it again but you always find that it never is. The, the lure and the, the, the riches that can come with gaining a package and successfully successfully getting it back up to your wing was was too much for a lot of people. Because I well, think be... I remember hearing that a prisoner if a prisoner was able to get a phone, just not even a smartphone, just any type of phone, it's worth up to a thousand pounds just for one phone. And it can the re, the temptation can be too much for some staff. I mean we interviewed one prison guard, his starting salary I think it was eighteen K and he was getting paid at five hundred pounds per package and bringing it up to three packages a day yeah that's did, mental did, did, did they did try there's um there were a few instances at hmp Kilmarnock where there was corruption with the staff and when you when you think back to the stories that i told you about me where really i didn't really do anything or whatever but that i mean there was instances of female officers sleeping with prisoners um in hmp Kilmarnock, but one of the ones that stand out was an officer that started on the training course after me. And I, I, pres- I think he worked in the education department and a prisoner must have just been like a vulture on him thinking, this guy's weak, I'm going to take advantage of this. And I think he'd, excuse me, started off by asking him to do just stupid, trivial stuff for him. Stuff that he probably, sh- excuse me, shouldn't have been doing, but it wasn't so bad that if anything was to come of it, it would just be a case of don't do that again type thing. But it got to the stage where the guy had done so much for the prisoner that the prisoner basically started blackmailing him. But not only did they start blackmailing him, he found out who he was, who his wife and his kids were, where he lived. He found out everything about him. So he basically had blackmailed blackmailed the officer. The officer brought in a mobile phone for him. Um, and then he brought in a couple of packages with some different uh, Class A drugs and stuff. And then they'd asked, the prisoner had asked him to bring something else in and they tried to refuse. And what had happened was is a couple of days later, um, there was a, a card, a, a 
deepest sympathy card sent to his house addressed to his wife, basically saying sorry for the loss of your husband. Nothing had happened, it was just a warning. And then he was coming out to his work one morning and they put a brick through the window of his car and stuff. And the pressure and the fear just got too much for him. He ended up basically putting himself in and saying, look, I've been doing this. Um, this is what I've done. I've refused to do it. This is what's been happening to me. Please just fix it. The police came and arrested him at the gatehouse and uh, took him away. I don't know what happened to him after. I don't know whether he got a custodial sentence or whatever, but the guy was that scared that he actually just handed himself in and said, look, this is what's been happening. Um, it's just so easy for them to gain information on you. With all that corruption going on, Martin, do you think that perhaps they tried to use you to deflect from what the corrupt officers were doing? I, I think in a way, I think in a way, it's, it is something that crossed my mind. I think when I look back now, the, the, two, the two female officers that I'd spoke about previously earlier on, um, one of them was um, quite well respected um, and she was getting promoted fairly quick um, up the, the ranks in the jail, and as I said, she was quite respected. So I don't know if I was maybe be being used as a decoy and a like a decoy story type thing to deflect away from other things that were happening at the time. It could be the case, I can't say for certain, but it's, it's it certainly has crossed my mind. And if that's the case, then shocking, absolutely shocking. Shocking regardless, but um, if they're actually physically using human beings like that, then that's horrendous, horrendous, because like I said earlier, the implications that it's cost, caused me and my time after being there is horrendous. It's affected family life, relationships, it's affected other jobs and a whole load of different things, and I'm just... I feel like I'm just finally starting to get back to my old self now. And that's been a few years for I've been there. So, yeah. How old, How old? what year was it? And how old were you when you actually left and didn't go back? So I left there in at the end of 2019. Um, and I would have been 31. 31. And was that a relief to not have to go back? I was the biggest relief and the biggest weight off my shoulders that I, I can't even tell you. It was like so much anxiety and worry and everything just instantly gone overnight. See, when I knew, when I finally knew that I never had to walk back into that establishment again, such a relief. Did you ever talk to your mum about it at that point? No, I never. I still haven't spoke to my mum. The first time my mum's going to hear about it is when she watches this podcast when it goes live. That's the first time she'll hear about it. And how, how have you managed to regroup yourself mentally? Um, I think since then I've, um, I've became a dad again and I've got my relationship back on track and just focusing on my family. And the biggest thing for me was knowing that everything that I'd done was always in the, like, be the best of intentions. I never, ever done anything wrong. I never done anything I was supposed to do. Always done everything above board. And, like, for a long time, I found it hard to believe that because of the kind of, the, the attention I was getting for the different departments in there, the security and intelligence and stuff. And for a long time, I, I found that hard to believe it myself, but I've since been able to kind of take my take myself out in my own situation and try and view it for like an outsider's point of view. And um, I've I've obviously done some uh, I've done some counselling since then as well. Um, nothing major, like just things over the phone and stuff. Um, so I've been given a lot of kind of coping techniques and mechanisms to deal with my anxiety and stuff and how to kind of just adapt to it basically and deal with it as best I can. And then, um, but if I'm being perfectly honest with you, the, the podcast that I've done with Chris and also this one, 
has helped me massively. Like, I can't thank you guys enough for giving me the platform and the opportunity to speak about it. It's the first time I've properly spoke about it out with just probably my partner um, and been able to actually speak about exactly what happens in these places. And it feels like, again, another weight has been lifted off my shoulder because it's finally out there and I'm getting to speak about it. And I find the more I listen to myself back talking about it, the more relief I feel as well. Because, as I said, for the last however many years, I've not really had anybody to speak about it with or um, been able to really say anything about it. And I was all, always had it in the back of my head that if I start talking about this, this stuff, they're going to come for me. But I'm in a position now where I probably realise that's not going to happen. And if it does happen, then they, they can bring up. I don't care. I'll fight them all the way. Because I, I would just like other people to know the kind of environment that they're going to be getting into if they're thinking about a job like that. And in particular, the type of environment, in particular, the HMP Kilmarnock is because it's mostly the same people that are still, still in positions of power in there. And I know that because I obviously still know staff that work there. So, um, yeah, it's been absolutely great for me. And doing these podcasts and talking about it have been like therapy for me. And it's been absolutely amazing. And I've had so much great feedback. I've actually received, after the podcast I've done with Chris, I received a message from one of the guys that started on the training course with me at HMP Kilmarnock. And he, he said it was absolutely brilliant that, to hear it and that, it's the first time he's actually heard anybody talk about it and he's so glad that he's not alone because he eventually ended up experiencing experiencing the same sort of bullying and targeting as I did. And he, he found it... I, I don't mean that he found it refreshing, but he found it comforting to know that it wasn't just him as well. So if I can make at least one other person feel better about that a, a similar situation like I did with that guy, then... It's all been worth it because um, it's horrend it's a horrendous place to be feeling the way that I was feeling like that back then, and I'm just glad that it's all behind me now and I, I'm able to talk about it without worrying. So for that, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity. Well, we we appreciate you spending time. I remember when I first started telling my story, I felt like I was releasing it and it was like helping me get my stress down. Well, you know, I put myself in the situation by breaking the law you're a completely innocent person so it's really unfair what happened to you so potentially for prison officers young men young women who are out there who are looking at that as a career what advice would you give to them so i don't want my own experiences to put anybody off wanting to do the job because not everybody in that job and not everybody running these places will be the same but I just want them to know that, like, you really need to be on your guard in these types of places um, because it's just so easy for to get yourself trapped and down rabbit holes and getting yourself in the wrong side of the authorities. Um, but most of all, just don't trust anybody. Don't trust anybody in these, these types of places. Um, and that's just coming from me and my previous experiences. Now I don't want to fully put people off because there is some genuinely nice, good people. And if you feel like that's what you want to do and you want to make a change, then go for it. Because listening to my stories, I didn't really have any issues with prisoners. It was all the staff that caused me all the problems. So if as long as you're going to an establishment where the staff are good people, then I would imagine that you could have a long and rewarding career. And sometimes I wish that I was still able to do it, but unfortunately the circumstances at the time didn't allow. As I say, I don't want to put people off, but um, just obviously be wary and uh, just just look after number one and then think about everybody else later. That would be my, opinion, my, my advice. Well said, Martin. And for the viewers who've been watching this now for over two hours with you, who want to perhaps reach out to you and, and contact you or support you or follow you on socials, do you have any of those? Uh, are you on any of those? 
Yeah, so I, I, I don't really do social media. I do have a Twitter. Um, if people want to get in contact with me via Twitter, it's um, martinconnell1. Um, I'll give you my email address and stuff as well, Sean, if you want to put it on the video. And um, if anybody wants to get in touch via email, they can do. Um, I'd welcome anybody, whether it's just anybody that wants any advice or just wants to chat or has been through anything that's similar to my experiences and would just like my opinion on something or whether it be anything else, then please get in contact with me. I'm more than willing to talk and listen and give any advice that I can. And, um, yeah, just contact me. I'll, I'll always be make myself available to talk to them, especially if it's somebody that's needing help or has went through anything similar um, like I have. So Martin's links and contact will be in the description box below this video if you're watching it on YouTube. I'm also going to put a link down there for Chris McPherson's channel. He's had some great guests on. I urge people to go down and support what he's doing. He's doing fantastic work. I look forward to giving Chris and Martin a big hug when I see him at the Francis gig in Glasgow on April 1st. I'll put the link down there for that. Can't wait to see you. We've got so many friends in Glasgow now. Can't wait to see a load of them up there. And viewers, please let us know in the comments what you thought about this. Look forward to reading your feedback. So take care wherever you are in the world. And huge thank you for Martin again for taking so much time with us this evening. So thank you for watching, everyone. Cheers, thanks, John. Cheers. Yep. Cheers until next time. Thank you.